Around the beginning of 2010, a user nicknamed DudeCon would start playing Minecraft during its very early development. He was a skilled programmer, and soon created several mods that caught Marcus Pearson's attention, leading them to work together on the greatest shift in direction the game would ever see. This player's contributions helped form Minecraft as we know it, only for them to be left as a minor footnote in its history. This is the story of Paul Spooner. The first public release of Minecraft was incredibly bare bones. People found themselves in an empty, finite world with only a handful of blocks at their disposal. Yet even with such extreme restrictions, these players immediately began doing amazing things. The first houses, castles, pixel art, YouTube videos, and mods would all be made within the first hours and days that followed. Even from its inception, Minecraft was a game with incredible potential and the community would begin to steadily grow. By the end of 2009, Minecraft was a rising star within the indie game niche, and tons of new things were being added to the game every week, from modern clouds, to trees, beaches, or decorative blocks, as well as strange mobs and items that would be removed later on. This was a brief period where Minecraft was popular enough to have a well-established player base that showcased amazing builds, invented some of the first mini-games, and were figuring out how to modify the game, all while being small and tight-knit enough so that every active user could have a voice. This was what things were like when DudeCon, or better known as Paul Spooner, would load into his first world. Paul was immediately hooked, mentioning how he would get lost daydreaming, thinking of all of the possibilities that the game could entail. After hearing that Notch originally intended Minecraft to be a first-person perspective of a Dwarf Fortress clone he was working on, DudeCon was inspired to make something similar. You've likely heard about Dwarf Fortress in other Minecraft history videos, and have no clue what it is. So what is it? Well, I don't know either, but it does look very complex, so maybe it could benefit from having a 3D version. Anyways, the first thing Paul had to do was make an interface to edit Minecraft worlds. After laying this framework, he made a mod that automatically generated castles depending on several factors that you could choose from. This could range from small forts, to massive bastions, and despite being basic, it's still far better than anything I've ever coded. These castles were originally made for the fortress part of Dwarf Fortress. But DudeCon soon realized that combining two completely different games that both had inconsistent major updates would be incredibly difficult to maintain. But after seeing forum members ask about joining maps together, Paul would create a mod that did exactly that. Except I should mention, these weren't mods. Instead, they were scripts. Nowadays, the four primary kinds of modifications you can find on Java are mods, resource packs, data packs, and server plugins. Scripts are kind of like an early alternative to the last two in that they are very customizable, can be more difficult to use, and don't necessarily add new things to the game, instead changing the code that's already there. Anyways, I just needed to bring that up real quick because I know more than a few of you in the comments section would freak out about me calling it a mod, although I probably botched this explanation anyways, so feel free to correct me. Okay, so where were we? As these first few projects were completed, DudeCon would post them on the Minecraft forum. The castle script in particular would be seen by dozens, then hundreds of players and garner a lot of interest and praise. But on March 9th, someone by the name of Salisbury Mistake would make a comment asking for something else entirely. I'm not so much into castles, but I really like the idea of a script that can add things to a level. I'd love to see a script that can make all the trees on a map taller. The leaves would stay the same, but the trunk height could be set by a value the user enters. Paul was up for the challenge, and a few days later uploaded Forrester, a script that did far more than what Salisbury originally requested. It allowed you to change how trees generate to be any size or shape you wanted. They could simply be taller oak trees, or shoot up into the sky with roots that dug through the floating end of islands, and even absurdly massive trees made from countless blocks. There were also options to grow mangroves and spruce forest. Nothing quite like this had been seen yet, 
especially considering it managed to generate so many unique variants of trees at a time when there was only a single type of wood and color of leaves. Appropriately, Forrester became a massive hit, as thousands of people would go on to view and download the script. DudeCon became well known within the modding community. He'd release a few more minor scripts, including one that generated city infrastructure, and Starstone, which added meteor impacts to worlds. While they didn't receive nearly as much attention, they were still impressive. He was clearly skilled with procedural generation, and Notch would soon take notice. It may seem strange now, but Minecraft was originally designed to exist in a pocket-sized world. A lot of customization was offered, arguably even more than now. You were able to choose the size, shape, type, and even theme of worlds. So you could have anything from a simple, average world, to floating islands that layered on top of each other, or even a terrifying hellscape stuck in permanent darkness. But all of this was finite. Worlds could only be around 1,000 blocks in length. And so Notch made the difficult and controversial decision to make the game far, far larger. On February 27th, 2010, the first version of Infinite Development, or simply InfDev, was released. And it broke just about everything, sending Minecraft all of the way back to the beginning. The world was completely alien. The sky was a flat, solid blue. All flora besides dandelions were removed, entities just stopped existing, worlds couldn't be saved, and the only notable structure for tens of millions of blocks were these extremely rare brick pyramids. Even the iconic Farlands were uncanny compared to what they became. It goes without saying, but this was unplayable, and the community would stay in old versions throughout March as InfDev slowly became more stable, with trees, mobs, entities and the like all being re-implemented. This was a fresh start. One where the path the game could take was unknown not only to the player base, but the developer as well. And it was during this critical period Marcus Pearson began working with Paul Spooner. He found the forester trees to be a lot better than the small, stumpy, and kinda ugly trees he had made in a rush, and wanted them to be officially added to the game. However, there were some immediate challenges. When Paul asked to see the source code for the current trees in order to design the new ones in a familiar way, Notch got defensive and flatly denied the request, demanding them be made from scratch. Paul Spooner found this behavior strange, as he was very opposed to intellectual property. To him, copyright was mankind's foolish obsession to own ideas, and felt he should be able to see the code. While Notch certainly wasn't an IP extremist, he still believed in its merits, and protected his work so that no one could truly copy it. Paul would eventually comply with the request, but it did represent a division between the two that would only grow over time. I kinda wanted to make this video Creative Commons as like a meta joke, but I don't think I'm able to, so don't try stealing my content. I will know if you do. Going forward, while he originally wanted to implement far larger trees, Paul was forced to limit them to the size of a chunk primarily for performance reasons. But he came up with were these familiar looking... uh... Decidiuses? Honestly, I feel like I've been saying trees a lot, but there's not that many synonyms for trees. Anyways, they were made up of logs that branched out from the trunk, with a thick canopy of leaves that most people would find to be a lot more realistic and aesthetically pleasing. Meanwhile, Notch was working on a completely new terrain generation that would hopefully fit well with the forester trees. Where before the world was mostly flat, it now consisted of very mountainous patches of land surrounded by lakes where you could find lots of neat areas such as cozy coves surrounded by steep cliffs, with floating islands all around. Finally, on April 13th, Paul Spooner's Forester script was implemented, and a new vision for Minecraft was born. Notch had always wanted Minecraft to be a fantasy game, and this seemed to be a major shift towards that. The player became a much smaller part of the world, with the lush trees towering over most of the difficult to traverse landscape blanketing much of it in darkness. As a consequence, the game became significantly harder as this allowed hostile mobs to be on the surface during the day. It also didn't help that there were no caves or leaf decay. Oh, and did I mention beds didn't exist? So have fun at night. Just a few months ago, players were the gods of their own little realms, with practically full control over every single aspect. 
Now they were helpless and forced to survive an onslaught of creepers and skeletons in an endless, unforgiving world. This obviously came with some pretty major issues. There was a drop in performance due to the complex changes straining Notch's poorly optimized game engine. Even worse, many of the players who had enjoyed the way things were got extremely upset, with the whole debacle causing a minor split in the player base, as some would stay in the classic versions until ultimately dying out around 2015. It's nice to know that our community has never changed. In an attempt to make things easier, mob spotting was dramatically reduced. But by June, Notch decided to remove Spooner's trees entirely. It's not known exactly why they were removed, he had a lot of enthusiasm for them, and even mentioned adding a new tree branch block. But to me, the primary cause of their removal was that they just didn't flow well with the gameplay loop. The small trees were just so much more convenient to chop down, and at the end of the day, that's more important than looking good. Soon after, he transformed the terrain into what became the iconic early alpha generation, balancing mostly flat forest with the occasional mountain range that rose up into the sky with grace. Minecraft had just seen its most dramatic shift in its entire history. In the span of three months, people went from playing a finite sandbox to a hardcore fantasy game and into the nostalgic alpha experience carrying a design philosophy that would be followed for years to come. Now as you might be able to tell, the large trees that had briefly covered the entire world weren't gone for good. By mid-July they were re-added, albeit smaller and a lot more scarce. However, they've stayed pretty much the same since, from Alpha to Beta, 1.0, and then all the way up to modern day, still using the original code a random Minecraft player made 13 years ago. Paul would continue working with Notch for a while longer communicating through email where he received various questions about programming and game design. Interestingly, Notch mentioned how he wanted to add villages, and asked Paul to write a script that could procedurally generate them. He ended up with these dirt huts with wood roofs. Nothing would come of it, but this is technically the first official version of villages we know of. The code for it still exists, but unfortunately I was unable to get any of the scripts working. Just a few weeks later, Minecraft's popularity would skyrocket, going from a niche indie game to a global phenomena in the span of a year, and subsequently Notch stopped responding to Paul's emails, leading him to lose interest and take a break from the game. He'd come back and work on a few more projects, but by 2011 the community had grown from around 10,000 players to nearly 1 million. Despite revamping some of his old scripts, and working with the developer of MC Edit for a while, he'd quietly fade into obscurity as years went on by and the game he once knew became something else entirely. So what did Paul Spooner get after all of this? Well, $500 from Notch, and recognition as a Mojang alumni at the end of the credits. I suppose that's a fairly reasonable ending to a pretty mundane story, but hopefully it's one you enjoyed. Hello everyone, if you want this video to be seen by more people, be sure to leave a like and tell me your thoughts on it down below. If you'd like to support the channel further, consider joining my Patreon to have your name listed over there. Otherwise, I'll see y'all next time. Goodbye.